So one of the most beautiful equations that we have in physics is Einstein's equation, which says the curvature of space-time is equal to the energy of matter. And usually we apply this equation to study four-dimensional effects, say in astrophysics, the evolution of galaxies, the evolution of the universe, um, how um, planets um, orbit around the sun and so forth. But there's nothing in this equation that indicates that it should only be valid in four dimensions. So if you notice, it just says curvature of space-time. Um, it doesn't say whether the space-time should be four dimensional or any uh, dimensions. And so this, uh, the fact that we use it in four dimensions is just because we experience a four-dimensional world around us, up, down, left, right, uh, forward, backwards, plus time. So what would happen if we, say, um, view this equation in any dimension, and in particular, high dimensions? So, in general, the expectation is that as you increase the number of dimensions, you have more freedom um, and you expect a, a richer variety of solutions. The intuition there is very simple to explain. Um, if you imagine we live on the surface of a ball and we're confined to this surface, then effectively we're living on a two-dimensional um, world. And say, if we want to go from one side of this ball to the other side, we really have to follow the surface of the ball. We have no choice. So we have to go all the way around following a great circle. But if we had access to higher dimensions, then we could go through the ball. And it would be about, uh, it would take about 50% uh, uh, less time to do that just by cutting through the middle. And so, and uh, similarly, if you decrease the number of dimensions, say if we lived on a one-dimensional uh, world, just a line, say, then clearly we're very constrained. We can only move left and right. And so our freedom to do things will be limited. So that's, that is uh, an intuitive explanation of the fact that if we study this uh, equation in high dimensions, we expect a much richer structure. But before I talk about uh, this equation in high dimensions, let's consider a lower dimension. So in three dimensions, it turns out that the Einstein equation completely fixes everything. It leaves no dynamics, uh, nothing for us to work with. And so three-dimensional gravity is completely constrained. It's a sort of almost trivial. In four dimensions, you have a rich structure. You have black holes. You have solutions describing the propagation of, say, gravitational waves that you uh, that we recently detected in gravitational uh, wave detectors, LIGO, as well as many other even more complicated solutions. So in high dimensions, you have many, many more black hole solutions. So whereas in four dimensions, we know that black holes have to be spherical, they're uniquely determined by their mass, uh, which is effectively the strength of the gravitational field that they generate, and their spin, which is roughly how the surface rotates. In high dimensions, you can have um, black holes where this surface that defines the black hole, the so-called event horizon, is ring-like, most like a donut, um, or you can have um, black holes within black holes, say a ring-like black hole with a spherical black hole at its centre, or you can have a black hole which looks like a string, and like I say, many other possibilities that you just wouldn't uh, 
you're not allowed to have in four dimensions. The other difference uh, between four-dimensional and high-dimensional gravity is that in four dimensions there are very strong arguments to suggest that black holes are stable. What do I mean by stable? That if we have um, a black hole and we throw a very small amount of matter into it, then there will obviously be some process by which the black hole um, gets perturbed and uh, the system becomes dynamical. But what we expect is that if we wait for a long enough time, not so long, um, then this black hole will eventually settle down, the system will settle down to a black hole of maybe a slightly different mass or slightly different spin, but nevertheless uh, a, uh, the same sort of solution. In high dimensions, this is not the case at all. So for example, if we consider uh, one of these black ring uh, solutions, then if we make them slightly too fat, then there will be an instability which, force, which causes, will cause this black hole to collapse in on itself to form a spherical black hole. Or for example, if we make this black ring too thin, then there will be an instability which will basically force this uh, ring to break up into many, many different black holes of smaller sizes. And similarly for other solutions. So with spherical black holes, if we spin them too fast, which we can only do in high dimensions, in four dimensions, the spin of the black hole is uh, bounded from above. There's only so, uh, so much that we can spin a black hole. In high dimensions, we can spin it how, however much we want. Then just to uh, as a physical way of explaining it, this black hole, which started out uh, to be spherical, becomes more and more pancake-like, and eventually it becomes almost like a surface. And again, at some point, this surface starts breaking up into many, many different uh, black holes. And there's a clear relation between the rich variety of black hole solutions that we have in high dimensions and the fact that they're unstable because these instabilities are what connect the different black hole solutions to one another. Another interesting different and uh, sort of pertinent difference between four dimensions and high dimensions is that in four dimensions, as we're clearly aware, stable orbits are, pos uh, are possible. So for example, the Earth moves around the Sun in a stable orbit, the Moon around the Earth in a stable orbit, and these are sort of planar orbits. In high dimensions, achieving uh, stable orbits is very, very difficult. Uh, generally, uh, stable planar orbits don't exist. And so uh, it's interesting that somehow Einstein's equation is telling us that um, it's interesting that Einstein's equation is telling us that four dimensions is actually the right number of dimensions, say, for life to exist, given that life really depends on a planet moving around the sun and so forth. And from this perspective, four dimensions is really a Goldilocks number. It's not too constrained like three dimensions where effectively there is no freedom and there is no dynamics. But it's also not too free so, so that you just uh, have uh, complete chaos, many different solutions, no stable orbits and so on. And uh, so that's that sort of nice because studying high dimensional gravity leads back into a very uh, a better understanding of uh, why four dimensional gravity is special um, and how it's special 
in general, the, the classification of high dimensional solutions is uh, a very big open problem. There are many uh, different ways that one can classify solutions by, say, assuming that they have a certain kind of symmetry or the they, uh, there exists a special vector field, a special direction along these solutions and in the hope that by assuming this we can integrate, we can solve Einstein's equations and find the full class of such solutions. And this has been an active area of research for around 15 years now. But the full problem uh, is uh, of finding, of classifying or understanding the full variety of solutions that one has in high dimensions is, uh, is a very difficult problem and it's one that uh, many people are working on at the moment.